Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our webinar to launch uh, the video series for Small Places, uh, Small Places Great Hearts that has been produced by ICMC's office in Europe um, and by our SHARE partners. Uh, the video series shows the integration of refugees in smaller communities across Europe. At any time, if you have any questions, Please don't hesitate to type them into the chat box at the bottom of your browser, and we're having a Q&A session at the end of the webinar, and we'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, our first panelist today is uh, ICMC Europe's own Maya Perlman, who is the resettlement coordinator for the, the video series. Um, Maya, can you tell us a, a little bit about the SHARE project and about the Small Places Great Hearts video series? Sure. Um, can you hear me okay? We can hear you fine. Okay. Um, so, the sh so SHARE is a network of local and regional actors across Europe that are working together to receive refugees and build welcoming communities. Um, SHARE was created in 2012 and it's now in the third phase from 2018 to 2019. Um, we are currently focusing on, or the current project focuses on receiving refugees in small size cities and towns and in rural areas. Um, because what we're seeing is that increasingly in Europe, um, refugees are being received uh, outside of capital cities um, and in smaller towns. And this is especially true when it comes to refugee resettlement. Uh, and so through SHARE, we try to support and work with these um, newly engaged um, cities and towns through uh, best practice exchange, capacity building, uh, and research. And we're um, in the current SHARE integration project. We work with uh, 10 partners in nine European countries. And these are the organizations that um, have also been leading the development of the Small Places Great Hearts uh, video series. Um, and yeah, the series um, uh, aims to portray success stories in seven different countries. Um, and uh, these are stories that are successful or positive experiences of um, uh, resettled refugees arriving to small size um, cities and towns. And they're successful for both the, uh, the newcomers and for the host communities. Thanks a lot, Maya. Uh, our next panelist is uh, Mr. Dennis Bosnick, who was the coordinator of the Small Places Great Hearts video series. Um, Mr. Bosnick is a journalist, videographer, and photographer based in Seoul, and much of his work focuses on uh, refugees and other forcibly displaced populations and humanitarian issues. You can find his work in the Deutsche Welle and the Wall Street Journal, among others. And um, Mr. Bosnick's work is uh, strongly influenced by his own story of uh, fleeing Bosnia, the Bosnian War as a child. Um, now, Mr. Bosnick, can you tell us about the video project? Hi there. Hello. Um, can, you, can you hear me well? We hear you very well. Oh, perfect. So the goal of the series is twofold. First one would be to counter the negative narratives about refugees in Europe. Um, a few years ago, when this so-called wave of refugees arrived to Europe, um, many Europeans started feeling a little bit resigned, uh, hopeless. They were afraid that they're not going to be able to do anything about this, that this is too much to handle. And uh, we're seeing that this is not true in small communities and bigger communities. Um, Europeans are super active. There are a lot of small projects and bigger projects where a lot of positive things are happening, a lot of positive approaches are being tried, and this is not very, very much covered. So this series uh, aims to show the positive and successful examples of what is going on in Europe, which is not uh, covered enough. 
The second goal would be to serve as a sort of an inspire, uh, sort of an inspiration to people who are uh, thinking about taking some action. So all of these videos that we're producing are basically uh, trying to explain to people who live in smaller communities that they can do things, they can do things by themselves, they can start those things, and that they're not that difficult. So uh, any action that is taken, uh, and if we contribute, you know. Uh, by showing uh, these videos to people who are thinking about starting something, would be, you know, um, we would be really ha uh, happy if if uh, uh, people would start uh, their own activities around uh, helping uh, with refugees. Uh, the video series is specifically uh, focused on resettlement, um, which is a which is a procedure of resettling refugees from third countries, uh, usually from uh, refugee camps uh, through the UNHCR and IOM and uh, local municipalities and uh, governments in different kind of places in Europe. And uh, we are trying, we are focusing on this specific uh, um, procedure because it is uh, very much uh, undercovered and we would like to people to know a little bit more about it. Great, that sounds really interesting. Uh, regarding specifically, you're talking about um, uh, per individual things that people can do. Is there throughout the series one specific example that you can give us that you found particularly interesting of individuals going out and uh, helping uh, refugees settle in? So uh, I won't say one specific example. I would just say that the little things help. The little things like coming to um, someone's house and teaching them the local language, um, starting a football club for, for the kids or even adults, um, starting some sort of a small group that does activities together, be it hiking, uh, music and so on. So all the little things that uh, anyone in a small community can contribute with are very, very much appreciated by both the refugees and uh, the local hosting communities themselves because uh, this brings people closer. It um, makes people understand each other better. So any single a little thing that uh, that people do uh, can help. Uh, if you're thinking about joining an NGO or starting an NGO by, uh, by yourself or with your friends, that can be super helpful too because NGOs are very, very vital, especially local, smaller NGOs are very vital to the success of these projects uh, all around Europe. So they usually work with um, municipalities and uh, basically coordinate on the ground. They know best. So. I would say any small little thing that you can do uh, would be great. Uh, one of the things that also stands out, um, I know this is going to sound a little bit strange, but bicycles. Um, <laughs> people's um, mobility is super important. Uh, if you're trying to reach uh, a bigger town or a job in a different town, or uh, simply trying to shop, very, very often uh, refugees are um, riding bicycles to, to get to the places where they need to be. So uh, giving them bicycles, uh, helping them uh, figure out how to ride a bicycle if they don't know how to do it, that is also a super important thing all around Europe. And I think that um, refugees are also dealing with the same issues that the local people are dealing with very often. So if you look at the Yellow Vest movement in, uh, in France, a lot of that movement has been about um, uh, mobility or lack of affordable uh, transportation. So refugees are dealing with this too. I would say bicycles would be <laughs> one of the things that are that that we've seen in this series uh, change people's lives, um, especially in Belgium and in Italy. People use the bicycles to go to work and to places where they need to be. Great, thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Bosnick. Um, now we'll, speaking of examples of people uh, joining together in their community, we'll watch the first clip 
from our series, which is the trailer that was shot in Austria. Also in Gänserdorf hat sich in den letzten Jahren einiges verändert. Durch den Zuzug dieser Leute ist die Stadt bunter geworden, vielfältiger geworden. Vor allem ist es ohne große Probleme gegangen. Wenn man mit Nachbarn lebt, muss man das Zusammenleben einfach gestalten. Das Zusammenleben mit den Geflüchteten ist jetzt schon sehr, sehr normal geworden. Ich würde mir wünschen, dass die Integration so weit voranschreitet, dass die Geflüchteten nicht nur die Sprache können, nicht nur Arbeit finden, sondern auch am Aufbau von Gänserdorf, von dem Land mithelfen und eine Verantwortung dafür haben. Okay, so that was the first video from Austria. And joining us today to share his experience uh, from the, who we've seen in the video is um, Dr. Hassan Halak, who we saw in the video uh, doing an internship in a hospital. Um, uh, Dr. Halak um, is a medical doctor who uh, arrived from Syria in uh, Austria in 2015 um, and with his family. Uh, Dr. Halak uh, will be joining us through the help of an interpreter. Dr. Halak, can you tell us about your experience of life before you arrived in Austria? Uh, he arrived in 2016, not 15. He wants to, to, change, to correct this. Then, yeah. Okay, thank you. And he, he would like to, to tell some kind of joke that just for fun that uh, he, he uh, three or four of his bicycles were already stolen just like recently. But that's just for fun. Well, that's not a very fun story. No, but... I, mean, just, uh, but, I mean, he doesn't want to complain. He, he just uh, he wanted to, to, to mention that because uh, uh, the, Mr. Dennis mentioned the bicycle. So, but uh, that's fine. So, uh, otherwise, what would you like to tell? Uh, he finished his study in 2014 in, 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 in Russia. And uh, he, he stayed in Lebanon uh, one and a half year. And it was really difficult. Let them look. Man can man live there without any rights, even to reside there or to, to live there. He tried to work as a volunteer uh, in, um, as, uh, as international uh, medical doctor. Uh, and, yeah. And it was really complicated. There is no freedom uh, uh, even to move. Even if, if it was prohibited to, to move after uh, 6 uh, p.m. And it was totally different when we came to Austria. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Halak. Um, you resettled to the town of Gensendorf, which has 11,000 people. As, as we can see in the long video, uh, it's mainly residents of the community that have uh, helped you settle in. Um, do you think that your uh, experience of resettlement would have been different if you had moved to a larger city? هل تعتقد أنه التجربة كانت ستختلف لو أنك انتقلت إلى مجتمع أكبر مثل فيينا أو أو مدينة أكبر؟ لا أكيد هذا الشيء طبعاً. This this the uh, uh, definitely it will it would be different in which way in في أي شكل؟ بالنسبة للمجتمع هون والشعب. For instance the people here in 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 this town. كان هناك مجموعة من الأشخاص المتطوعين. There was plenty of people uh, who were volunteers. 
are around like uh, at least like 10 people helped us uh, all of them were really cooperative uh, some of them helped us in the schools for children the others helped us in the official uh, official bureaus some of the third categories helped us with uh, practicing the language and I, th I think it would not be the same situation when we were in, in Vienna so, uh, or in some big city. So I think the smaller, uh, smaller communities is, is better for resettlement uh, experience than the, uh, to, to be resettled in, uh, in big cities. Maybe because some politic, some some political reason for some political reasons, some most of the families moved already to some big cities. Uh, because the 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 some some laws here and some instructions government give more uh, help to the people who lives in the big cities. And that's because just the government, the governmental uh, procedures. Uh, because the, the refugees outside the big cities, they, they get much less money, which is not even uh, enough to, to live. And jobs opportunities are more in the big cities. Thanks you. Thank you, Dr. Halak. So if I understand you correctly, um, there is a lot of advantages to uh, being resettled in a smaller town in terms of integration. However, there could be more help uh, to resettled refugees. Um, could you, in the video, we see you performing an, in, an internship at the local hospital. Um, can you tell us about what you see about your professional future in Austria? Uh, I like my profession and I would like to continue as a medical doctor. Uh, in order to help people to uh, to reduce the pain of the people I worked here uh, for, for four months uh, as a big practical uh, and it was really a successful experience Allah and, and now I have to pass some uh, exam uh, in German language. That's my, my that's the only obstacle which I find a little bit uh, hard. But I hope that I will pass this exam soon, and then I will start uh, uh, work as a medical doctor uh, with full capacity. Well, we certainly help so too, and I'm sure that your friends in Genzendorf can help you uh, practice the language. Um, among the people that we see in the video uh, from Austria is uh, Mrs. Margot Linke. Uh, Mrs. Linke is the deputy mayor of Genzendorf since uh, 2015, and uh, she is also personally invested in uh, the integration of resettled refugees. Um, Ms. Mrs. Uh, Linke, can you tell us about uh, your personal experience in accompanying refugees in, and integrate, helping them integrate in Gensendorf? Hello, can you hear me? We hear you and we see you very well. Hello. So my per personal um, experiences with refugees were very positive. Uh, our first uh, family who came with this uh, refugee project were, uh, came in 
2015. It was also a big family and we are a group of, of people uh, trying to help them. Uh, we uh, tried to um, bring them all the things they needed, for example, clothes or um, furniture or bicycles, for example. Um, and uh, the Halak family um, and Hassan, they were the second family uh, coming 2016. Um, we had a little experience <laughs> then. We, we knew what uh, bureaucracy um, is to do so we can help the family with all those papers and things they, they are needed. Yes, and it, we have a, a rather big group uh, helping uh, with language. Uh, educating the children and the adults too, so I think it works rather well. And this, um, these volunteers or these community members just kind of organize themselves uh, without, just just by themselves. There was no um, no NGO or no, no one to uh, support. Yes, we are. Uh, a small local NGO, I guess. Uh, we have, before the refugees came to Gensendorf, uh, we tried to, um, to focus on other people, especially women, uh, uh that, who, who don't speak, um, German. Uh, so we had experiences uh, with uh, German courses with, for Turkish uh, women, and so we were prepared to 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 give the language also to other people. <laughs> Good, wonderful. Um, <laughs> uh, so resettlement or even refugees are. Fair, it's a fairly new phenomenon in Gensendorf. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how the community reacted, um, the positive aspects, but also if there were challenges, how you addressed them? Um, it's not really a new phenom phenomenon uh, because um, at the times of the war in former Yugoslavia, uh, there were also refugees who came there and I hope I'm also in contact with people of this group of former refugees. Now they live here as Austrians and are free to do whatever they want. Um, but it was different um, because there were refugees from uh, out of Europe and uh, also with different religions. And so in the beginning, it was um, very open and the people were, were very helpful. But as time went by and the politics got um, a, little, a little bit stricter, also the people were uh, not so open-minded. But of course, the group who uh, supports the people who know the people personally? I think it's a very, um, a very you know, necessary thing to know a person because it always depends who who is coming there. And when you see, it's just people like you and me. It's just a family with children and having a normal life like everybody, so it's much more easier to to integrate. Uh, the schools were very important, and teachers were very supportive to the children, and yes, so it worked rather well, I think. Thank you. Um, can you share one example uh, of how refugees have contributed to the community in Gensendorf? Uh, Yes, um, we have um, 
family here from Iran. And uh, this man, um, he, he wanted to do something, not only to, to learn, especially in those phases where there were no German courses for him. And he, um, he went to our uh, senior um, a senior one, Wohnheim. I just I don't, don't have the word in English. So it's a, a place to live for elderly people. And he, so it's, it's he went there home. every day to, yes, to help there and to talk to the people, also to improve the language. And so it's a good example. And also, uh, Mr. Halak is also very keen on working with people and helping and and once i had um, a, an elderly woman who had to move from one flat to the other and there were the boys of the families helping to carry the very heavy um cupboards and things it was really really helpful and nice so it sounds like um the refugees are gaining by learning the language, and uh, the the people in the elderly home are are also gaining. So it's a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. I, I think it is. Yes. Thank you very much, um, Mrs. Linke. Now we're going to go to watch the second extract of the video series. This one was shot in Romania. Înainte să fie sprijinit de statul român, românii deja mă sprijineau. Ceea ce a fost foarte ușor pentru mine. Am început la sat, în sat, în satel, nu în oraș. Ce buceam eu la început era doar agricultura. Aveam unde să dorm, aveam ce mânca, aveam cu cine povesti. Și a fost prima ușa, o ușa care s-a deschis către calea integrării. Now, um, in the first extract from Australia, it's the uh, from Austria. I'm sorry, it's the community members that join together. Um, we don't see in this in the video from Romania, but it, in the video from Romania, it's mainly the church uh, through the church that the community uh, got together to re, um, to um, help uh, refugees settle in, um, and in the uh, now we're going to speak to Mrs. Marlene Van Dam, who is a social worker for the Dutch Council for Refugees. The Dutch Council for Refugees has been a nonprofit that has been helping refugees since 1979. And this is a third model that focuses a lot on uh, coordinating uh, volunteers. Um, so Mrs. Van Dam, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. Uh, okay, so great. Mrs. Van Dam, um, so the, the Dutch Refugee Council uh, relies heavily on volunteers um, to help with integration. How does that system work and what would you say the advantages are to this system? Uh, yeah, our whole organization is uh, built on volunteers. In uh, the area where I work, we have 200 paid coordinators, but we have 4,000 volunteers to uh, helping with the social integration of the, the refugees. Um, uh, we, our whole um, um, uh, working process and schooling and training is focused on uh, making volunteers in social base getting things are focused on pay. It's social work expensive, and then you have to, for example, for one or two hours a week, a volunteer um, 
uh, can uh, can make much more hours a week for helping the social uh, integration. For example, uh, when you have to explain the public transport, it's very uh, complicated to uh, to learn. But when you go to the machine, explain how you can have a public transport uh, chip and how you re can reload uh, the, that system, it's uh, it will take a few hours and you help them with uh, using the public transport. And it's not because also I think about uh, cost and bicycle less in the country. And it's all the differences between the, uh, the lands they come from. It's everything is different. So it's nice then when a volunteer explain you about the, the that easy questions for social workers, for example, they explain maybe about uh, the paid one about tax, uh, how to uh, social benefits, papers, but the ordinary social integration is based on simple things, uh, uh, cycling, uh, public transport, walking on the market, explain how things work. And um, the nicest thing for uh, the refugees is that they feel welcome because of volunteers helping. You know, we say always coaching because they have to learn it themselves, but it's it's um, uh, they do it because they like to welcome new uh, new people in the country. That's really uh, the, the refugees always say that they really love that way of uh, guidance. That's completely different. If a professional say my caseload is 50 or 80 and I have to check everything, that's the, the whole atmosphere for the welcoming process is is completely different. So that's really an advantage to have much more time, um, you know, really other atmosphere than professionally. It's 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 really a, a welcome feeling for the refugee. So that's I think a win-win situation. Great. I'm sorry you cut out a little bit, but uh, oh. uh, from mm. what I did, from what we did understand, um, it seems that working through volunteers helps a lot with integration. It allows uh, uh, refugees to feel more as part of the community, but also allows um, there to be a lot more time spent than uh, if we were working only through social workers. Um, can you tell me what volunteers say that they get from the experience? Yeah, we have different kinds of volunteers, and every volunteer wants to have yeah, gains by different uh, things. But we have young people who um, like to improve their curriculum vitae for finding a job, and we have really a professional atmosphere in the organization. We have planned social integration with checklists, with um, training and schooling, so they get uh not helping but coaching skills focus on the self-reliance of refugees they can uh, get training about recognizing psychologies uh, uh problems uh consultation skills all kind of, of of things that they really got rich in schooling because we invest a lot in schooling to we we call the volunteers always professional volunteers because they get lots of schooling and training uh, inside our organization. And that's what they learn, young volunteers. Old volunteers, they mostly said that they like to um, to, in, to uh, give the, the experience they have, uh, have had in their own life to give to new people who come in the country. They say I, lots of volunteers when they get uh, retired, they have worked as managers or uh, have done lots of experience. So the network is, is big from older volunteers and they really like to, to match volunteers of uh, refugees and the network they have. And that really got lots of um, uh, good feelings for the older volunteer. And, um, uh, and they also love to meet new cultures. When you retire and you sit at home and you want to do good time uh, investment in, in your spare time when you uh, retired. It's really nice to meet other cultures. Yeah, they invite each other so they know about the kitchen, eh, to cooking, and they go uh, talk about how it was in, in the country where the refugee lived, and the, the older volunteer tell, tell about what, uh, what experience here are. And that interaction is really inspiring for elder um, elderly volunteers. And we have lots of people now, they are 
in between jobs. Um, for example, they come from a um, uh, commercial um, uh, business and they want to try to, uh, if the social working is something for them, so they use it as an in-between job. So they only stay for, an, for one uh, year, for example, and they uh, uh, get a rebuild the uh, curriculum vitae, but they also uh, build a network, a new network in the social uh, social uh, segment of, of the work. So, and in our organization, there's um, room for uh, starting new projects. So you've got uh, lots of uh, freedom in uh, putting in your skills you have. And uh, for volunteers, that's really nice. It's lots of freedoms in, in the goals of our organization, of course, but that is really fulfilling. That's, I think, uh, we give training room to uh, to start projects and also to uh, give your own experience to others. That's really fulfilling uh, when you are older. So that's it, I think. Great, thank you. Do you have uh, one specific example of uh, that a volunteer shared with you of how the volunteerism has enriched your lives? Oh, that's difficult. I, I think I have lots of experience, but we we have, for example, here in this city in Zandam, this near Amsterdam, we have um, a volunteer and a Syrian refugee. They started um, a restaurant together. That's really special. So um, uh, that's an example, but that's really uh, that's special. But I think in the um, um, I know some young refugees they uh, playing football with uh, Dutch um, Dutch volunteers. So they uh, made a new team and now they sport every week. So uh, by sport and interaction, I think that's uh, the best thing for integration is to uh, to sport together. And that's what uh, they say. But yeah, the most stories I got uh, for the volunteers sometimes uh, invest 16 hours in or sometimes 24 hours in our organization and then I ask what do you win by it and I think they most of the time they say it's really inspiring because you hear lots of things about refugees and, and but it's so nice to have uh, yeah, some kind of uh, close contact because you yeah the social integration is really an intimate thing to to share together and I think the, the normal stories are for me the most uh, impressive, actually, <laughs> uh, that they say we hear, they always uh, in the news, in the newspaper, we hear a lot about it. But now we meet, we met each other and that changes their life in the in our own social network. They see each other uh, when uh, the, uh, they have um, uh, a child who celebrate the birthday. They come on parties and that kind of simple integration things are, I think, the greatest. So that's the stories who, uh, for me, uh, the, the simple stories are the nicest to tell for me, actually, because that's the motivation for people. Because on, on stories, they or on a birthday, they tell to the neighbor, I met a refugee and it was so nice. And I think that's also for the whole community very important for the integration for others, because the commun community has to uh, uh, stay open for new people. So that's important, I think, to uh, uh, that stories for me are the most important one. So it's the small everyday stories that make the, yes. the real difference. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The yeah, let's say sometimes there is frustration on, on national policy, for example. And, uh, and then, uh, but volunteers always say, but I stay working because I love to work with uh, this group of people. So nice to to um, and they are very important. I think the volunteers because it's the first person when you come in new city and they welcome you and they're making time for you. It's it's really a close most of the time um, contact for life. It is, Good. Yeah, it's, actually that small thing is a great thing. Good. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Van Dam. Now we'll go ahead and we'll watch the third video and last video for today, uh, which was shot in Belgium. Garden, 
نبر که وام با آن سوگام که پر آبدن است یا آن گام که بدن یعنی پر چاتن لخوگرتن فهم کردم چی تل عیل ما فدا جون دی فدی پر مجون دی فت میل که اون وانی تو فینه واسه هیچ دتال باریاره omdat het, ge- het gezin was toch blij met gewoon een, een onderdak hier in de buurt, in het dorp waar ze zich goed voelden, waar ze hier blijven. Hoe in de binnen, waar ik het had aan, 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 waar ik Okay, I would like to remind everyone that if you have any questions, you can go ahead and uh, type them in the chat box. In the meantime, I have another question for Mrs. Van Damme. Uh, Mrs. Van Damme, we didn't see this in the extract that we just saw of the Belgian video, but there's another part of the video where the football coach says that it was by seeing Hiba, the daughter of the family playing, that it changed his mind about the Syrian culture because he saw that she was very free. Um, I would like to know if from your experience you have any stories of how either volunteers or other community members have uh, changed their mind on migration, on uh, cultures and on um, refugee welcoming through their experience, uh, direct experience with the refugees. I, yes, I have some uh, examples. Um, yeah, most of the time, uh, refugee, uh, the volunteers, but also community members have some kind of stereotype view of um, uh, the refugees. They think they're poor. They think uh, uh, they uh, don't have any mobile. And it's the, the, the simple thing, but they have the stereotype. They change it completely when they um, uh, uh, when they meet, and sometimes they're going to do things together. Uh, I already said also sports uh, and starting uh, a restaurant. That all kind of things. The the the, the essential I think of my um, story is that uh, when known is beloved, I think when they meet each other, they are they have a stereotype. Uh, view in the beginning, yeah, they think they they surprise. Oh, they have a mobile phone. They really have some kind of uh, stereotype uh, uh, thinking that uh, people are poor and uh, uh, don't speak the language. And then they meet and they see, oh, you speak English, or or, or you know how to how the telephone is working, and you have some kind of specialism because they have a completely a uh, resume or a curriculum vitae, some refugees or they are doctor or they uh, have very good in, um, uh, how do you say it? Uh, is my English? Uh, now in some kind of specialism, for example, we have an artist making beautiful paintings. They're surprised that they, they all think refugees are poor and don't know anything. And they're surprised when they bring uh, the specialism and, and they see, oh, they have a life before they came here. And that's very difficult for Dutch people to uh, think about what the refugees uh, had experienced before they come here. So they really focused on the place here. That's the experience they have had in the in the mother country. Um, that's where they surprised off. So they, for example, a very good cook or very good painter, or it was a doctor, and they they're really surprised about that. It's, I think refugees are normal people like you and me. Actually, I think that's the that's the the thing I want to say. And in the yeah. beginning, they think, oh, it's strange, strange people, and they really have questions and don't have any idea with lots of stereotype uh, thoughts. And at the end, they say, there are people like you and me, but luggage and 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 i think that's uh, uh that's the most surprising thing i think and then you surprise about a girl who's playing football yes they say, oh you can play football or they say oh you see somebody running and eh, jogging every morning with uh in in really traditional clothes for example that's everybody's surprised because it's different and 
but when you know a person and see through that, uh, through that, then, then, um, yeah, they, and that's what I said, be known is beloved and they, uh, really fond of, of the, the people they met. Thank you, Mrs. I hope, I hope you understand my essential. <laughs> yes, yes, we understand that, um, uh, that uh, refugees come with their experience, that they can share with their new communities. Um, now I would have a question for Mrs. Linke. Mrs. Linke, um, what from your experience do you think are the most effective actions that people can take individually to promote better acceptance and integration of refugees in communities such as your own? Um, hello. Hello. Well, I think there are many, um, many uh, opportunities, possibilities to, to do. We once um, had an event uh, also in a church. We have a very beautiful new church with a big um, auditorium. And there we had a kind of um, concert. There were a, 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 a cultural event uh, where we presented the families who are living here in Gensendorf from different um, countries. Um, uh, the, the family, the Halak family also was there. They had a big um, a photo, um, a photo picture with the names of the family members uh, and also the other families. Everybody had a poster for his family, and there were was uh, different musicians playing. The family made a, a big. Um, they could have cooked their local foods, and we had a big. Um, <laughs> Buffet to <laughs> many different things to eat and was very beautiful. And there were many people from all around, uh, from Gensendorf, but also from the villages around. And that was a really good event, but it was <laughs> much work and so we we just had it one time, and but perhaps we we do that again. That and also good. once in uh, in Christmas time, we try to invite the fam the families in a in a hall of Gensendorf, uh, just that they that they meet with all the helpers and and all the people who were fled to, to Gensendorf, and we made it a kind of Christmas party all together. It, that was also beautiful. Good. <laughs> it sounds like it's events that uh, help locals and refugees connect and also help uh, refugees share their personal experience from you know what they what their their capacities from before they 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 moved, yeah. which ties in also to what Mrs. Van Dam was saying that refugees come <laughs> yeah. as, as complex people, and it's by by showing people that that we can help integration. Yes, of course, the these normal things like playing in a football team or uh, just. Um, Singing together or playing—that's of course this is a bit, that's a basics, yes. But for um, get a kind of um, publicity to other people who are not involved, I think that those events are very a good and a good example to make kind of advertising, <laughs> perhaps. Yes. Thank you, Mrs. Linke. Um, now I have a question for Mr. Bosnick. Uh, Mr. Bosnick, your work often focuses on refugees in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, what role do you see uh, for smaller European communities playing in refugee resettlement in Europe in the future? Right, so in my experience, smaller communities are 
uh, are fun for one specific reason. They have their nose in your business. In a, in a bigger city, people usually don't really care much for each other or um, to put it in a different way, um, communities are created based on interest. In a smaller community, um, in a smaller town, communities created based on who is available around. So uh, in smaller communities, people know what's going on. Uh, they're very aware of who other people are. They're very aware of what problems they might be facing. While in a bigger town, that is a little bit more difficult, especially if you're living in an apartment block and basically your neighbors, you see them maybe in an elevator. Smaller communities very much are able to shorten the response time to any problems that are the, that pop up. So basically, if something happens, uh, people in the small town, in a small town, are much more quicker to respond and much more practical. While in a bigger town, usually refugees have to rely on, on institutional uh, actors, so uh, big organizations, NGOs, and so on. And while these are super helpful and incredibly important, uh, they're also much slower than you know just help by local people. It also has a downside. Um, so in my own experience, uh, escaping Bosnia, we, we arrived to Slovakia in the end. We, we ended up in Slovakia. And uh, basically, during that time, when a small community of, of the town where we ended up uh, didn't know anything about who refugees are and what it means to be a refugee, um, their response was super welcoming. They were very, very open. They were very helpful. And no one really bothered us, you know. No one really had any negative emotions. We were let, uh, we were allowed to do what we needed to do to succeed. So my parents were able to start a business. Uh, we were integrated into the schools very, very quickly. And no one, we, we didn't experience any kind of negative emotion or resistance to our presence in, in that town. Feeling new in a, in a country is also a thing that um, is very scary for a person that just arrived. You're new, you don't know the language, uh, so a smaller town, just by the fact that it's uh, possible to understand within a day, its geography, its connections, um, bus routes and timetables, where the shops are, uh, where you go to do what versus in a big town, you don't know where the office is, how to get there, and so on. I always say also that this is a two-way two street. Um, I'm not a proponent of um, refugees, basically, um, like us thinking only that we need to help refugees. Refugees are fully-fledged human beings who uh, have their skills, have their dreams, have their passions, and so on. And if we are able to integrate them and allow them to integrate uh, in, uh, into our societies, they're going to be super beneficial to our societies. They can contribute to our, to our um, labor markets. So in the, in the series, we have a few examples of, of people actually working um, in the local communities where the local community actually helped them find that job and uh, created stability in their life. And on the other hand, Locals now found, find uh, these refugees indispensable in their businesses. So it is a two-way street, and uh, a smaller community is much better equipped to handle human interactions than uh, a bigger town. Thank you, Mr. Bosnick. I have a question from the audience for Mr. Halak, for Dr. Halak. Um, someone would like to know what advice you would share with refugees seeking to integrate into Europe? You mean the advice the volunteers or the refugees themselves? Advice to the refugees who are seeking to integrate. Uh, uh, learn the language as soon as as quick as possible. Uh, to integrate to mingle with the with the 
a host community ااا وكان افضل يعني التحقيق ذلك طبعا بالمدن الصغيرة. It was better when when man tried that in the smaller communities in small towns. أفضل. نعم أفضل. Yes. Better. It's better in small communities or in small towns. خلها بدي أشكر السيدة مارغوت لينكي. And he would like also to to thank Mrs. Margaret. Margaret Linky. Margaret Linky. And uh, Joseph Radinger. And Joseph Radinger also, who helped him in, in, uh, in this journey. Uh, and learning uh, the language and, and giving the help to the family and to him personally. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, our hour is over. This is all the time we have, unfortunately. Um, so we will be leaving you on this. Thank you very much to all our panelists. Thank you to everyone who has joined for the conversation. If you've missed part of it, it will be online. The, the, the webinar will be online tomorrow, as well as the trailers to the videos, so you can share that. Uh, you can find it on www.icmc.net. And um, the long videos will be coming out also very shortly, so look, uh, look out for them. I'm wishing you a very happy World Refugee Day tomorrow, and it was a pleasure to spend this time with you. Thank you very much.